we were near a sort of more of a teen pop band, really, and uh, girls chasing us on the street, screaming. I've got to tell you, it's a great laugh. I just think we thought, let's, let's go all the way, let's be big, let's go for it. By now, the band were in the pop big league, competing with bands like Duran Duran for pole position. They were our rivals. I mean, people have, have said in later years that we were, you know, us and Wham were, or us and Culture Club, bollocks. It was, it was us and Spandau. We were really in competition with Duran Duran. One of us had to be the best, and that we wanted it to be us. Yeah, we took it very, we took it very seriously. It's the only time, and I have to say, it's the only time in in, in my career and in the band's career that we've ever, ever taken any rivalry at all seriously. Yeah, we wanted to be top of the pile. That was as simple as that. And you know, a lot of bands get to the stage and sort of bottle out. We wanted to play Shea Stadium. We wanted to be the best band in the world. Are you ready? Sort of parade tour, there were yeah backdrops and you know things like very lights. We had a few of those and yeah, fantastic double bass drums, gongs, all sorts of uh, rock and roll heaven. That's what you want. I mean, you know, and the arena thing, we took to it like ducks to water. I have to say, you know, I love strutting around on the big stage, big show off I am. <laughs> That was kind of like when we were, yeah, rock gods. <laughs> it was our rock god phase. Probably the biggest tour, and the Barricades tour was probably the best production. When I had an eight foot drum roll and bar underneath, and we had a dartboard and stuff. So, you know, the bits and through the Barricades, like, you know, bits at the front with some guitar and vocals and stuff. End of the number before that, I used to go downstairs, see Obson, my drum tech, have a you know, little game of darts, talk about football, a couple of JDs and Cokes. And, uh, you know, resume my position for the bit where the drums come in and the song gets really interesting. Post True, everybody had more money and, and had more resources available to the group, so everything did become more luxurious. There's nothing like it in America sitting in the back of a limo with a vodka and tonic or a bottle of Jack Daniels or whatever. It really was like stepping into the telly or something for us. You know, we couldn't believe it. It was like it was like your dream. You're just in a dream. Okay, well we're just off to uh, Milan now. It was kind of flaunting wealth in a way. All that kind of that dynasty thing was very much part of that period of like, let's look, you can be rich too. We can all be rich. <laughs> The 80s was about overspending, and uh, so we kind of overspent. We did do a bit of a loads of money, but we never earned that much money. I mean, you know, I probably earned about 40k a year on average, you know, which is good money, but not earth shattering. You're not going to buy your mum a house on that, are you? It was sort of Joan Collins kind of fame. They were famous for, for being a pop group, and, and you saw them doing the things that pop groups do, which was which was playing and asking about and, and being adored by their fans. And that was really how it manifested itself, you know, and was pretty much a constant whichever part of the world you happened to be in with them. There was always parties, and there was the you know what we call the dodgy boiler passes or the dragon passes. So you'd send the um, you'd send the the minders out um, to, to recruit people for the party, you know. I was working by now for this number one magazine. I basically just had to do a diary of, of the, you know, the, the, the two weeks. Each day we get a little bit 
paper would come under the door with the itinerary and it would say 11 o'clock after the show there will be a bit of a party and then basically I think, I think this was the idea of the promoters Paul Dainty but he would basically phone all the model agencies in, in the uh, area and uh, basically be a large black bin liner in one corner filled with champagne and two bottles of beer and then just all the models in the other corner and then the band somewhere in between with sort of I don't know, a couple of other people. <laughs> it was very pleasant. This band now are a boozing band, really. Um, our rider over the years, you know, got to astronomic proportions, really. We were told that our, the budget for our, for our uh, tour was highly expensive, so we thought, well, where can we cut back a little bit? And then someone had this great idea um, about cutting back on the rider. You know, we would cross off the things that people don't want. So straight away, you know, it was 12 bottles of champagne. Do a gig, you've got to have a bottle of champagne, haven't you? So that stayed on. Um, uh, cases of lager, I've so many cases of lager. Cheers, England! Yeah, you've got, you've got to have beer, Steve. Um, bottle of vodka, bottle of Jack Daniels, bottle of every spirit. You've got, you've got to have that. Case of, you know, what about gin? I don't know about gin. Well, yeah, you've got to have that, yeah. Eventually we get down to a carton of concentrated orange juice. And somebody says, well, who drinks that? I don't. No, I don't. I don't. Steve, how long's this been on the rider? It's a fucking waste. It's a bottle of concentrated... Who, how long's it been on there? I said, you don't have it, do you? It's a, it came off, right? That's about all we saved until we got down to the cheese board. And we all said, oh, look, you know, it comes in a dressing room every night and no-one really touches it. It starts to stink after we've been there for a while. It's just going to get crossed off, at which point Martin Kemp put his hand up and said, you know, I like a bit of cheese now and then. In the mid-80s, the record industry had developed a spend, spend, spend policy, which produced a radical new marketing tool, the pop video. Because of the way that videos had suddenly become so important for a group, for a marketing group, this developed this bizarre sort of video war. It was rather like the nuclear arms race, and, and which sort of Spando and, and, and Duran Duran. As soon as the video thing started happening, I think we really kind of took the initiative and became kind of more the active part of the, of the, of the rivalry. Duran Duran were, were filming uh, Rio and, and going to Thailand and, and we were being left behind in Battersea. I think the first place we went was the, was the Lake District, which was hardly as exciting as Sri Lanka. But eventually we ended up in, uh, in Hong Kong and uh, in the southern states of America shooting in the swamps and uh, we did our extravagant um, tourist videos.